Good morning, people of First. Welcome to worship. It is October 25th when you're watching this, but I'm recording it on Thursday the 22nd, and can I tell you, it is a most beautiful day. The trees are changing, the sky is blue, the sun is up, it is a wonderful day, and I hope that as you reflect on Thursday, you had a great day and got outdoors and got some fresh air and enjoyed the beauty of God's creation. I'd like to thank the people who um, have turned in their estimate of giving cards. Uh, we had a great consecration Sunday. I loved having Mike Whitaker, uh, my friend, come and preach with us. And thank you for those of you who ordered pies and came and got them. We want to celebrate you and your ongoing faithfulness to this congregation. If you still have an estimate of giving card that you'd like to turn in, please feel free to get those into the church office. We are trying to figure out um, our future together, and your gifts make a big difference, so thank you for that. Next Sunday will be Communion Sunday, so I remind you to get your bread and your juice together so that we can have communion together, even apart. Let's worship God. Please join in the call to worship. God of life, whose love enfolds us and spirit fills us. We praise your holy name. God of joy, whose sunrise wakes us and sunset amazes us. We praise your holy name. God of hope, whose promise sustains us and power upholds us. We praise your holy name. God of love, whose patience humbles us whose touch can heal us. We praise your holy name. God of peace, who breaks down barriers and walls that divide us. We praise your holy name. God of eternity, who has always loved us and by grace has saved us. We praise your holy name.
let us pray. Eternal God, God of the former things, God of the new day, God of every tomorrow, open us to your unending grace, made fresh for us in this new day. Give us the vision to see your purpose for our lives. Make us into your beloved community, ready to praise and serve with passion and vigor. Amen. morning children of first can you see those numbers behind me 1906 that's a year that's the year that this building was built that's called a cornerstone and this is our church look there's the gargoyles I love them so this church has been here a really long time it was built in 1906 this is 2020 so it's been here over a hundred years that's a long time but I want to tell you something, even before this church was built, even before people were here worshiping God on this corner, um, God was already here. Because our scripture today says that God is from everlasting to everlasting. That means that God doesn't have a beginning or an end, and there's no time that God is not. 
So I want you to just know that um, this God that we love has always been, will always will be, whether churches are on corners or not, we can always put our trust in God. Love first. See you guys. If you have a Bible near to you, I encourage you to get that and turn to Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and woe, for they quickly pass, and we fly away. I'd like to add to our scripture reading a passage from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, just to reinforce this one thought. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So this sermon this week will appeal to history buffs, fans of travel. I think it will tickle the people who love John Wesley. There are at least a few of you along with me who love John Wesley. Two years ago this month, I traveled with Bishop Frank Beard to England on the ordinance trip. We have a, a tradition in our conference of raising money to send our ordinands on a trip together. Sometimes the bishop travels with them, sometimes not. Um, one year I went on an ordinance trip and we did a work service project in Juarez, Mexico. Sometimes, frequently, they go to Israel. But this particular year, two years ago, our bishop wanted to go and do a Wesley pilgrimage. So we visited sites we had read about and preached about, but most of us had never seen. We went to a lot of places that could have hung up the shingle. John Wesley slept here. As we longingly recall the days when we could take trips and travel around the world, and as the national election heats up and the emotional intensity around us reaches fever pitch, I hope this message will break into the action and speak about the truth of God's eternal presence and care for God's people. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we want to root ourselves deep into your eternal nature, trusting that you have gone before us, that you have been behind us and beside us. In all times and in all places, you are already there. Give that truth to us as a comfort, that we might rest in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So First Presbyterian Church right across the street here, our neighbor, is the oldest church in Champaign County, founded in 1850 by eight settlers. Their first building went up in 1854 at its current location. 170 years, that's a long time. Our congregation got going around 1854, built the current church, the cornerstone says 1906. That's 114 years ago. The city of Champaign was founded in 1855, 165 years ago. The University of Illinois kicked off in 1867, 153 years ago. Busey Bank opened its doors in Urbana in 1868, 152 years ago. The Virginia Theater is a newcomer, opened in 1925 as the Guild Theater 95 years ago. Now those are some really old buildings and businesses in our community. Old at least by American standards. 
One of the first things that hits Americans when they travel to Europe is this, is we have a really skewed interpretation, or a really skewed concept of old. Things here in America, like Plymouth Rock, which I've been to and which was a great disappointment, it's a little rock in a cage, but anyway, Plymouth Rock 1620 or Jamestown 1607 are barely out of infancy compared to the incredible churches and other buildings you can visit in Europe. We had that experience too, that sense that things are old in Europe. They've been around for a long time. Time stretches out differently and reassembles itself with new wonder when we consider the span of humanity on Earth. Think about Stonehenge. Stonehenge in England dates to 2000 or 3000 BC. That's a thousand years before King David ruled Israel. The Psalm says, and across all time and over all the earth, God has remained constant from everlasting to everlasting. It says this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. Time is different for God. God who is eternal. I'd like to share with you some of the places that we visited when we went to England um, and share a little bit about their history, the, the, how old they are. One of the places that we visited that had nothing to do with John Wesley was the town of Bath. The town of Bath was uh, Roman geothermal baths that were founded around 65 AD, that's almost 2,000 years ago. Um, Julius Caesar was running Rome, Jesus had lived and died, but it's right around that time when the early church was forming. The Roman Empire stretched from as far north as England and as far east as Israel. It was a vast empire, but that empire rose and it fell, and God remained the same. One of the places that we went to that is a John Wesley site was St. Andrew's Church in Epworth. This is where John Wesley grew up in the early 1700s. The docent at St. Andrew's when we were there tried to put time in perspective for us. He knows that Americans have a hard time because we have such a new country. We're a baby, really. So he tried to help us place time in perspective. We had walked up to St. Andrews along a well-worn path, and he said, the path you walked up to come to St. Andrews is one people have been walking up for 1,000 years. <laughs> I'd like to help you understand the breadth of time this covers, he continued. 500 years ago, 1520, half of the 1,000 years that this church has stood here the pilgrims hadn't even begun to think about traveling to Plymouth Rock, where they would land in 1620. This church is much older than anything a person can visit in the United States. It was in this church that Samuel Wesley, John's father, who was served as the rector or the pastor, he served there for 39 years. He's buried in the churchyard. Um, kind of makes me wonder which parking lot I might get buried in. <laughs> We held a silver communion cup from 1706. The date was on it, and they let us hold it. And I can tell you that the clergy, the United Methodist clergy there, were so excited to lay hands on this communion chalice. It's very likely the cup that John and Charles Wesley received their first communion from. It put all of our hearts in palpitations. But the thing that really moved the whole group was when the lecturer turned around and gestured to a baptismal font. Every Christian church has one, a place where people get baptized, and told us that that baptismal font is 950 years old. It sent chills through us. The pastors on the trip had a moment, tears and hushed wonder. Imagine all the baptisms that had taken place at that baptismal font in the course of 950 years, including John and Charles Wesley. Century after century, that church has been faithful to the Christian mandate to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
Family after family opened themselves to the amazing grace of God in the waters of baptism at that font. God has been work at in that small village through that small church for a thousand years. A thousand years, the psalm says, a thousand years in your sight, God, are like a day that has just gone by. For us, it was monumental to think of the span of time and the human lives that had been touched by that one small church. Now, I'd like you to fast forward to the museum we visited above the new room in Bristol, established by John Wesley in 1739. In that museum, there is a placard reminding us of John Wesley's commitment to living out his faith in the real down and dirty times he lived in. And John Wesley was a person who really tried to, to melt together a call to deep personal piety and social justice. So in that place, we read John Wesley's principles in the 18th century. It says a political manifesto for today, question mark. These principles, this is not something John Wesley wrote. He didn't write a political manifesto. That's a question posed to the people who come to visit. What he did write about, what he did preach about, and what he did live out in his life is a commitment to the principles that are listed here. His principles in the 18th century. Reduce the gap between rich and poor. Seek to ensure full employment. Introduce measures to help the poorest, including a living wage. Offer the best possible education. Empower individuals to feel they can make a difference. Promote tolerance. Promote equal treatment for women. Create a society based on values and not on profits or consumerism. End all forms of enslavement. Avoid engaging in wars. Avoid narrow self-interest and promote a worldview. Care for the animals with whom we share our planet. <laughs> you know, 280 some years have passed and not much has changed. We're still struggling to address many of the same issues. The church has worked over the centuries to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And for what it's worth, the world is a better place for the people who follow, because of the people who follow Jesus Christ, the work that they have done. In Jesus' name, universities have been built, health care has been provided, legislation has been created to protect the rights of people without power or voice. We are part of an ongoing stream of believers who, armed with a vision of the kingdom of God found in Scripture, it's a place where people have enough, everyone has enough, where rights and human dignity are advanced and protected, where strangers are made welcome, a concept from the Old Testament, early on in the Old Testament, strangers are made welcome, and God is given praise. You and I are bigger, are part of something bigger than our moment in history. We are part of God's ongoing story. We are participants in bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. A thousand years in God's sight are like a day that has just gone by. We also traveled and stayed in Coventry, and this is not a John Wesley site either. There, have been a, uh, there has been a worshiping community of Christians in Coventry, England since the mid-1000s. A couple of churches were built and destroyed until finally a monastery and cathedral were finished in the 1200s. Henry VIII had the monastery shut down and taken apart stone by stone for other uses when he made England Protestant. But the worshiping community remained. A hundred years later, St. Michael's was built in the mid-1500s. On November 14, 1940, and I bet you know this history, some of you, on November 14, 1940, the cathedral was destroyed by German incendiary bombs. The community has made a commitment to keep that shell of a church as a witness to the destruction of war. On Christmas Day 1940, Provost Howard made a radio broadcast offering a vision that when the war, war was over, he would work to build a kinder, more Christ-childlike world 
with a new cathedral acting as a center for reconciliation. And that's what they have done. They rebuilt, <coughs> they rebuilt a new cathedral next to the shell, that, the, the Bandab shell of the old one. And they have been doing their mission of trying to lead the world to reconciliation to end wars between people. Their mission that they stay focused on is peacemaking and reconciliation for almost 60 years. For 1,000 years they have been fulfilling their mission as a worshiping congregation giving praise and glory to God. Um, they have been fulfilling their co-mission or as we like to say the Great Commission Jesus Christ gave us. Then Jesus said to them, came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you, even to the end of the age. So that church has been working on behalf of the kingdom of God in different ways over a thousand years. They have been teaching people how to model their lives after the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. The picture that you can see now is the baptismal font at Coventry. We saw the baptismal font um, at St. Andrews in Epworth, 950 years old. This baptismal font at Coventry is from rock that was hewn from Bethlehem in Israel and brought to England. As a tour guide was speaking to a group at one point, uh, he said, this rock from Bethlehem is thousands of years old. That's pretty good, right? Thousands of years old. But he was interrupted by a man, one of the members of the group, who raised his hand and said, sir, we're all geologists, and we can tell you with certainty, based on the fossils we see here embedded, that this rock is probably three or four million years old. Doesn't that give you a thrill? Before we were ever a twinkle in anyone's eyes, millions of years ago, God was at work creating the earth, and now in a church in England, there's a three or four million year old rock that serves to baptize new believers to the faith. Across time and space, thousands or millions of years, thousands of miles, God binds God's people together in purpose and in power. A thousand years, oh God, in your sight, are like a day that has just gone by. I have mentored a number of people coming into ministry, and with that process of coming into a new career, a new calling, a new vocation, uh, comes some stress. You know, every job has stress. And one of the things, uh, when they get completely stressed out, I have reminded them of this truth that has uh, held me uh, tight for years, is this. The sun will come up tomorrow. Whatever is troubling, whatever weighs on us, the sun keeps rising and giving us a fresh start to tackle the problems before us. When a day goes badly, when we mess up, when we don't get everything done, my thought to myself is this, Julia, be at peace. The sun will come up tomorrow, and you'll have another chance. In the musical Annie, there is a well-known song, the sun will come out tomorrow. That's not my wisdom. I cannot promise that rain will be banished and the sun will shine, but I can guarantee, and so far I have been 100% correct, I'm very proud of the statistic, the sun has always come up the next day. Not by any power that I possess, but by the power of God who brought this world into being. The sun has never failed to rise. Each day is a new day to commit myself, ourselves, to the ongoing, timeless, eternal work of God to bring about the kingdom that God envisions. No doubt we're going through a difficult period right now, but we have every reason to keep the faith, to stay strong and to press on. As the psalmist rightly points out, our days may come to 70 years, or 80 if strength endures, or if we're Dorothy Shirley, 104 years, but you get the point. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. That is a truth for human beings. We come and go. We get things right, we get things wrong, 
We stay close to God, we fall away. We create problems and we solve problems. And through it all, God's steadfast love remains with us. From before time began until this very moment, God has done God's good work of creating, redeeming, loving, and healing. God is eternal. In the next couple weeks when the news threatens to overwhelm you or worries you, my suggestion is that you turn it off. Crack your Bible. Read a psalm, words from 3,000 years ago that continue to sustain and speak truth to us. Sit quietly and breathe. Find yourself centered on the God whose name is I Am, the eternal now. God was, God is, God is to come. Our faith is in the one who is from everlasting to everlasting. Our peace, our hope come from this truth. My peace in troubling times is that God is. God's gone before me, God will come after me. Before this church ever was, God was already here. I hope that you can find peace in troubling times by resting in, by remembering that God's everlasting love is with us. Be at peace this week. Amen. Let us pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to the offering today, I'd like you to share your prayer requests in the Facebook comments if you're watching this on Facebook. I'd like you to consider Mike's message from last week about surrender. Is there a part of yourself that you have not surrendered to God? Is there an anger or a resentment that you're hanging on to that you need to let loose of? Is there a capacity for service that you have not engaged in? Is there wealth that you possess that you might want to give to the work of God? Whatever the thing is that you have not yet surrendered, I pray that you will consider surrendering all of your whole self to God.
Thank you for coming to worship today. It's time to get connected, and I'm gonna tell you a true thing. In the last few months, the thing that has brought me the greatest joy is seeing the people of our church. Last Sunday, as they came to get pies, it was a beautiful thing to see our congregation. I miss you. Please stay connected with one another. Join hands with your family members if you're at home. Feel yourself connected to me and to this congregation if you're watching alone. But most of all, know that you are connected to the God who is from everlasting to everlasting. It is in God we place our trust. Go from this place today, go from wherever you are, to love God and to serve your neighbor. You are part of God's good work. Go in peace.